Hello and welcome back to the Superhero Kill Count. I'm your host Miles and today we're counting all the kills in 2011's Thor. After the relatively mediocre shown from Hulk and Ant-Man 2, as far as fan reaction and critics are concerned, Thor honestly just kind of stayed the course and was right down the middle for a lot of people. It's one of the first times when the MCU got weird with gods, goddesses and other realms making their first appearance, so the fact that it stayed the course with the more relatively grounded additions is actually pretty impressive. That being said, I know I personally and many people online really dislike Thor for one main reason more than anything. Dutch angles. The movie is full of them and you spend half the time tilting your head to either side to see what's going on without getting a headache, only to get a stiff neck. Anyway, none of that is important. What is important is how many kills happened in this godly addition to the MCU. And again, that's godly in the sense of gods, not godly in the sense of the quality of the movie. So let's dive right in and find out. The movie begins in Puente Antiguo, New Mexico, where a team of scientists are tracking an aurora located entirely within this desert. The team consists of Darcy Lewis, played by Kat Dennings, Eric Selvig, played by Stellan Skarsgård, and Jane Foster, played by Natalie Portman. Things quickly heat up as the aurora turns into a tower of spinning lights, which they drive headlong into, knocking over this bearded guy, straight into a time jump to Tonsberg, Norway in 965 AD. Here, Anthony Hopkins as Odin tells us that once, humankind was aware of the other realms that are home to gods and threats such as the Frost Giants. Led by Odin, the Asgardians fought back when the Frost Giants attacked Earth and pushed them back to their home world. But not before a massive battle scene. Oh boy, here we go. And just so you know, I'm only going to count kills that we see directly here, otherwise it's going to be impossible. So first of all we have Laufey, King of the Frost Giants, attacking this village with an ice storm. He's played by Colm Fjord, who you might know as Reginald Hargreaves from the Umbrella Academy, or if you're a true cinephile, as Dr. Malcolm Walsh from Face Off. We see, I think, 20 people frozen on screen, from the boat to the last people running away at the end. Then, during the battle between the Frost Giants and Asgard, I believe we see five Frost Giants and five Asgardian soldiers either die in general combat or be bodies on the ground. Two Asgardians then get frozen and shattered by Laufey himself, and finally three Frost Giants get either stabbed or shot by Gungir by Odin. On the flyover of Jotunheim, the home of the Frost Giants, I don't know man, just look at this. There could be some bodies down there, but I can't see them. I'm just going to assume they're doing some nice dancing with each other. In the end, the Frost Giants will push back to their home world and have the source of their icy power, the Casket of Ancient Winters, taken away from them to keep them docile. After all of this, we see that Odin was not actually telling the story towards the audience, but was instead telling it to his two sons, as a way to teach them what they will one day have to defend. Jumping forward again, we see both of these boys fully grown, with Thor, played by Chris Hemsworth, before he started dyeing his hair, clearly being the favoured son, be given a standing ovation as he approaches the throne to ascend. He even gives a cheeky wink to his mother, not who I named something like that, but uh, tweets their own. Odin rises and begins his speech, calling Thor his heir, much to the chagrin of the baby-faced Loki, played by Tom Hiddleston. We fly away from this speech and into the weapons vault below the throne room, where a trio of frost giants have broken in to steal back the casket. They take out two guards and are about to get their hands on the casket before Odin senses their presence and activates a metal protector known as the Destroyer. As the name suggests, this thing destroys the three giants in seconds before stepping back into the fog from whence it came. Odin and his sons arrive to assess the damage, with Thor telling his father they should take the fight back to the frost giants to teach them a lesson and make sure this never happens again. Odin, wanting to keep the peace and maintain the treaty, says they will do nothing, which Thor doesn't much like, but he's not king yet, so it's really just too bad. Also, while we're here, I have to mention all the different weapons and artifacts that you can see in this place, since there is quite a lot of cool stuff. This purple eye-looking thing is called the Tuning Fork and was used by Odin to summon extra-dimensional threats to test the powers of young Asgardian soldiers. This stone tablet is the Tablet of Life and Time, which is said to contain a formula that could heal the user and make them near immortal and omnipotent. This other eye is the Warlock's Eye, which has the power of mind control. And in the background, as a giant is getting disintegrated, you can see some sort of gauntlet, but I don't really have a clue what that could be all about. Also, there is a shocking amount of practical set design in this movie. The weapons vault, tons of the other rooms in Asgard, the throne room were actually made practically on huge sets. As well as this, the small New Mexico town was made from scratch and is entirely facade, and it looks fairly real for the most part. Add on all the armor, helmets, and weapons, and there is a shocking amount of work that went into making these things look real, and honestly, it all looks pretty great for it. Anywho, back with Thor, he's not too pleased that he's not only not king, but he's also not been listened to by his father. After some table flipping, Loki comes to speak with him and tells him that he agrees with Thor, but there's nothing they can do without going against Odin. Instead of seeing this as the wall stopping them from doing something stupid, Thor sees this to mean that they'll have to go behind his back, as long as it's for the good of Asgard, of course. 
He explains his plan and tries to get his band of merry men to follow him in the form of Lady Sif and the Warriors Three, who might just be some of the shallowest characters we get in the entire franchise. He does say their names, but instead, why don't we call them Bob, Steve, and Greg? Because honestly, it doesn't matter. They do that little in the MCU. Anywho, he manages to convince them by regaling them with their past exploits, and they head to the edge of Asgard where Heimdall, played by Idris Elba, stands guardian. Heimdall can supposedly see everything in the universe all at once, so he's just as curious as the rest of them as to how the Frost Giants got past his watch, so he allows them to pass. He activates the Bifrost, transporting them near instantly to the Frost Planet. They set off in search of the inhabitants of this seemingly barren world, and eventually find Laufey, who supposedly agreed to a truce with Odin all those years ago. He taunts Thor, calling him a boy desperate for a fight, as others move in to surround them. Just as the group go to leave, one of the giants calls Thor a princess, and everyone knows what that means as they let out a collective groan and Thor launches the offending giant through the air into a wall with a single strike from his hammer. An all-out brawl starts with the rest of the group having no choice but to join in, and of course, and that means more possible kills with fast camera cuts. Yay! We're going to do these mostly one hit since it's nameless frost giants being taken out pretty quickly, so let's go by killer. After kicking things off, Thor ends up with, I think, 30 actual kills. Now, he hits a lot more, but 30 was the number of hits he made that looked like they'd result in some form of death. As for the others, Bob gets a pretty sweet kill with some sort of throwing knife. Loki picks up three with a mix of stabbing, throwing weapons, and magic. Lady Sif gets one with a good old stab, and so does Steve with a stab with just a little bit more flair. In all the action, Greg gets grabbed by one of the giants and his skin is frozen from just being in contact with them for a short time, so he warns the others not to get touched. Loki immediately ignores this and one grabs his arm, shattering his glove and turning his entire arm blue, but with no real damage to him. I do wonder what that is all about. I also love how the Frost Giant looks at him, like, the fuck's that all about before just getting stabbed and dying anyway? Truly glorious. Anyway, Steve gets hit by a straight icicle, so all the others begin to retreat as Thor continues to fight, clearly relishing in the action. Laufey sees this and releases a huge creature encased in ice known as a Frost Beast, which immediately sets off after the retreating warriors. Just as it's closing on them, Thor calls down a bolt of lightning and collapses much of the surface of the planet, taking many giants with it. But the beast manages to run upside down using its claws to keep up with the warriors. All in all, I counted 55 frost giants knocked into the large fall by Thor. I'm not 100%, but I'm doing my best here, folks. Just as the beast corners them, Thor leaps into the air and flies straight through the beast's mouth, clean out the other side, taking it down for good. And no, it's not getting countered. It's not even nearly humanoid enough, so it's against the rules. The day isn't quite saved, however, as they're now surrounded by the remaining Frost Giants, and there's quite a few of them. Just before they make their move, the Bifrost comes down, dropping Odin in the middle of the Warriors, who tells Thor to can it, as he tries to smooth over the situation. Despite Thor killing a small town's worth of Giants, Odin asks Laufey to forgive and forget as boys will be boys. Laufey, unsurprisingly, doesn't go with this, and says they are now at war. Just before he can take a swing at the Allfather, Odin rears upon his horse, summoning the Bifrost, and taking himself and the group to safety. Back on Asgard, Thor and Odin get into it, lobbing insults back and forth, and I must say, the Shakespearean delivery from Anthony Hopkins is pretty top tier. I mean, the man literally growls at Loki, and he makes it look cool. <laughs> he makes his decision to punish Thor, as he is unworthy of everything he has given him, and casts him out, as well as placing an enchantment on Mjolnir that will only allow those that are worthy to possess the power of Thor. I can't imagine that will ever be important later on in the series. Back on Earth, we're with our group of scientists who look after Thor and rush him straight to a hospital after hitting him with their car and tasing him for acting like a crazy person. As they're driving out of the desert, something else falls from the sky. I wonder what that could be all about. The next day, the science show are analysing their data and theorising what they saw was an Einstein Rosenbridge, or a wormhole, and that Mr. Thor came through it. So they head to pick him up from the hospital, but he's already escaped. <gasps> dun dun dun. With no other choice, they head off in search for him, even if it takes hours, days, no, we- What? Oh, all seconds. Back in the desert, people have found the hammer, which was the mystery object that landed last night, and have gathered around trying to lift it. People are lining up, but no one can shift it even an inch. Stanley even tries to pull it using his truck, but all he gets in return is a hefty mechanics bill. Just as this is happening, we see a familiar face turn up and get a replay of the exact post credit scene from Iron Man 2, showing Shield is on the case, finding out exactly what's going on. Back with the team, Thor is getting dressed in a very necessary scene for everyone, but if we're going to have several of Scarlet in her underwear, it's only fair. Over on Asgard, Loki and the Warriors are talking, and Loki reveals he told a guard to alert Odin the moment they left, meaning without him, they'd all be dead. Lady Sif begs him to convince Odin to change his mind, but Loki stands firm that he's too dangerous to come back and rule, with just a tinge of jealousy and resentment. Bob suggests he might even be the one who let the Frost Giants into Asgard, since his magic would easily allow him to let people through. Loki then heads to the weapons vault and touches the casket of Winters, turning himself a little blue, dabba dee dabba die. He confronts Odin, who breaks and tells him that at the end of the war, he found a tiny frost giant baby, belonging to Laufey, left to die for being so weak. 
Loki lets out a Shakespearean yell of his own, and Odin tells him he took him as a baby in the hopes of creating an alliance between the two realms, using the baby as a bridge. Loki, understandably, feels betrayed by this and lays into his father as he collapses. Back on Earth, Thor is enjoying a hearty breakfast of eggs, pancakes, pop-tarts, and coffee. Some men walk in, talking about the crater and how everyone was trying to lift the object found in the middle. Thor, hearing this, heads out to find what he rightly assumes is his hammer. The group follow him before agreeing that they need to get back to work, rather than following someone who is seemingly completely delusional. Heading back, they found that S.H.I.E.L.D. has swarmed their lab and is seizing all their work and equipment to get more info on the phenomena in the desert. On Asgard, the warriors go to speak with Odin, but find Loki in his throne, acting as king, whilst Odin is out of action with the Odin sleep. Odin sleep is pretty much just a deep state of rest that he enters to charge his power. He's been putting it off for years with the rising tensions with the Frost Giants and his sons, so now that he's completely out of charge, he may not rise again for a pretty long time. The warriors have no choice but to ask Loki to unbanish Thor, but of course Loki isn't going to undo Odin's final act or bring back anyone that would threaten his claim to the throne. Back on Earth, Selvig is in the library using their computer to contact someone who might be able to help them with S.H.I.E.L.D. Just as he's leaving, he stumbles across a book about Norse mythology and notices similarities between it and everything he's seen over the last couple of days. Jane, meanwhile, is sat waiting in her van and spots Thor headed to a pet shop where he demands a horse. Sadly, they're all out of stock so Jane instead offers him a lift, since she really doesn't have much else to do now that all of her research is gone. En route to the crater, they have a little bit of a flirt conversation, where Thor is so sure of himself and his power that Jane will know exactly who he is once he gets back his hammer. They arrive after dark and find the crater has been transformed into a heavily guarded shield facility, with scientists analysing everything they can about the hammer and the area it landed. Jane and Thor scope out when Thor heads in to reclaim his hammer. Not exactly being known for subtlety, he knocks out two guards, steals a poncho, and heads in. A storm appears out of nowhere as he makes his approach, walking through guards of ease, but not taking anyone out for good. Coulson orders some eyes in the sky, and we see someone grab a bow and head into a platform to get a bird's eye view. This is of course Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, played by Jeremy Renner, in the first of a surprisingly large number of MCU appearances. Thor takes out the biggest guard they have and makes it to the hammer, where Coulson orders Barton to let him try, just to see what happens. He grabs the handle, expecting an easy lift as he's done many times before, but no matter how hard he pulls, it doesn't move an inch. He screams to the sky and then falls to his knees defeated, allowing himself to be captured, seeing the enchantment placed in his prized hammer just before being hauled away. Jane gets back to the lab and explains what she saw. Eric argues it's all science fiction and that Thor is crazy, but Jane insists that something about him is special, and maybe all this magic that they're seeing that's coming straight from a children's book is in fact real, and they simply just don't understand it yet. Meanwhile, Thor has been interrogated by Coulson, who's a little bit hurt that Thor made his elite guards look like Paul Blatt. Thor isn't talking, so Coulson leaves to deal with other things. Loki then appears to speak with Thor and fill him in on what's been happening, telling him Odin has died, and it's pretty much all Thor's fault for starting a new war and getting himself banished. Thor begs to be let back, but Loki says a truce with Jotunheim is conditional on his exile, so not a single person wants him home, even his mother, and with that, he leaves. But not before having to go and lifting the hammer himself, which he of course is not able to do, since he's not worth it either. And if you're wondering why no one can see him, I mean, he's Loki. He can literally make holograms of himself. I'm sure he can make himself invisible. Just as Coulson returns, he's alerted that Thor is a visitor, and it's none other than Selvig, claiming he's Dr. Donald Blake, a part of their research team who went a little bit mad after having all their work taken. Donald Blake being the name of Jane's ex-boyfriend, whose clothes Thor ended up wearing. Coulson doesn't buy it for a second, but lets him go anyway to see exactly where it leads. Selvig takes him straight to a bar to go over exactly what is going on and tells Thor he doesn't care if he's crazy or not, he just wants Jane safe. And the best way to do that is for Thor to get as far away from her as possible. With that, they get to drinking and Selvig tries to keep up with the young god. This of course ends excellently with Selvig getting positively shit-faced and being dropped off by Thor in Jane's camper van. The two head outside where Thor returns Jane's journal, which he managed to swipe as he was leaving the crater. Thor explains that Jane is right and that magic and science are just the same thing where he comes from. He explains that Earth is one of the nine realms connected on Yggdrasil, the world tree, and that he's from Asgard, another of these realms. Meanwhile, Loki heads to Jotunheim alone to speak with Laufey, revealing himself as the traitor allowing Frost Giants into Asgard, just like the warriors thought. He offers to conceal a group of giants into Odin's chamber, where he'll allow them to murder him and take back the Casket of Winters. But hang on a minute, Loki said Odin was already dead. Does that mean that he lied to Thor? Truly shocking stuff, folks. Upon his return, Heimdall notices that he couldn't see Loki in his trip, just as he couldn't see the giants that snuck into the vault, and more or less openly accuses Loki, but he's lord to Asgard and has no choice but to obey his king. The warriors decide they can't stand by and do nothing, but without Heimdall on side, they can't do a thing. Looking for them, Heimdall happens to leave Hofund, the sword needed to activate the Bifrost, lying around when he goes for his lunch break. Loki sees this and orders the destroyer to follow the Thor and seek them out and destroy Thor. The four head to Earth and are picked up by Coulson's equipment, who heads off to investigate the landing sites. Back with the scientists, Thor helps serve breakfast for a foggy-looking Selvig, and it has always bothered him here for some reason that he cleans his hands off with a towel after holding plates. 
He literally carries them like six feet. The hands will be fine, Chris, don't worry. Anyway, no time to worry about that. The warriors track down Thor and fill him in on exactly what's been happening, exposing Loki for the liar he is. On Asgard, Heimdall now openly accuses Loki of sneaking in the giants, and Loki retaliates by stripping him of his title and citizenship, which means that Heimdall no longer has to follow his orders. He takes a swing but is frozen by a concealed casket of winters before he can even land a strike. Back on Earth, the group of warriors and scientists spot the destroyed land, knowing it's coming straight for them. Coulson's team are right on top of it and approach thinking it's another piece of Stark tech. The face piece opens, but instead of RDJ, it's a disintegrator beam that appears firing at their cars, but I'm not sure we see anyone get taken out here. The warriors prepare for battle with Thor and the scientists, instead focusing their efforts on evacuations to keep people safe. They manage to keep it busy for a short time, but they're no match for something so powerful and are easily dispatched. Though, not lethally. Thor orders them all to retreat and stop Loki as he walks up to the Destroyer unarmed to attempt to call it and Loki off to protect the innocents in exchange for his life. The Destroyer seems to power down before letting loose a savage backhand that sends Thor flying and in a seemingly critical condition. But you know, all of that was pretty worthiness inducing, don't you think? Odin's enchantment seems to agree as Mjolnir launches from the crater and rockets towards Thor, being caught at the last second and restoring him to full HP and vigor with massive stat buffs across the board. Now at max power, he creates a huge storm, pulling the destroyer into the air with him and somehow not the seven people who are watching this happen from several feet away. He gets rid of the destroyer with one good knock to the head. That's effective, he should leave with that all the time. And yeah, the destroyer is staying off account since it seems to be basically a puppet for the King of Asgard rather than a sentient being. Now in the comics, it's shown to be an actual character, but here, that's all we get. Just as Thor's going to leave, Coulson turns up and accuses Donald of telling some pork pies. That means lies if you're not fluent in the art of rhyming slang. Thor tells the son of Cole that they're on the same side and he'll be happy to collab in future as long as they return Jane's work and equipment. With that, he heads off into the desert to summon Heimdall and return home, not knowing that he's still frozen solid. Back in Asgard, Loki lets in Laufey and some frost giants, leaving a couple to guard the gatekeeper. Hearing Thor calling, he manages to break free and easily dispatches the two giants before opening the Bifrost and transporting them all home. After a quick chat and smooch with Jane, of course, just Thor. If they all did it, that'd be more weird. Thor leaves the others to help Heimdall and heads straight to Odin to save him from Loki and the giants. The Frost Giants break into Odin's chamber where one is taken out by Frigg before Laufey knocks her aside. He then moves in to take out the Allfather for good, but is stopped in the nick of time by Loki? God, these daddy issues really do be a plague for these Marvel men. Thor arrives and exposes Loki to their mother before being blown through a wall. Loki somehow beats Thor to the Bifrost on a horse and sets it to work destroying Jotunheim to take out the Frost Giants for good. And oh, for God's sake, we get to see it! Come on, Thor, for once, tell, don't show. How am I supposed to count this? You know what? No. We see some buildings collapse and people run away and they get caught in a cloud of dust. I'm just going to say that they're caught in a cloud of dust and they're completely fine and that the minute the camera cuts, all the action stops. This movie already has the highest count by far. It's going to be okay, guys. Thor and Loki debate ethics with Loki insisting they should destroy them all just like Thor wanted to a few short days ago. Loki taunts Thor to fight him, only working once he threatens Jane. The two get into it in, honestly, one of the best final showdowns that we've seen in the MCU yet, though two of those were two robots that look the same fighting each other, so I'm not sure that really means anything. Loki uses his magic to create projections of himself, but Thor dispels them all at once, laying Mjolnir on his chest to keep him down whilst he struggles to shut down the Bifrost and save Jotunheim. Seeing Nova way, Thor begins to hammer away at the bridge to destroy the Bifrost, even if it means never seeing Jane again. With one last swing, it's done, and the pair are sent flying into the void, only to be caught by Odin at the last moment. Loki insists he did all this for his father in Asgard, but Odin isn't buying it, and with that, Loki lets go and falls into the void, never to be seen again for one scene. Later, Thor is shown avoiding the celebration to mourn Loki with Odin, who he now sees as the wise king and father he was, and acknowledges how much he has to learn. He then discusses Earth with Heimdall and checks on how Jane is getting on with him, never losing hope that they might see each other again. Finally, we have our post credit scene where we see Selvig meeting with Nick Fury in a S.H.I.E.L.D. facility. Fury shows him a strange blue cube in a box, which he believes could hold unlimited power, and Selvig, seemingly influenced by Loki, agrees to take a look. Wow, way to kill any suspense on that character death, guys. So, how many kills do you get when you add a literal god to the universe? Let's get to the numbers and find out. I'm Noel, whenever you're ready. One hundred and thirty-six people died in Thor, with one hundred and sixteen male, two female, and eighteen of an unknown gender. We're looking at a mighty blue tower with just a teeny, teeny red peak. Compared to other movies so far, it's straight to the top of the movie leaderboard, closing in on double Iron Man One, which has been our leader since the start. Going over to the heroes and villains, Thor in his first show was responsible for over half of the kills with 86, with Laufey coming after him with 22, and Loki and Odin lagging behind with four and three respectively. I'm going to give the Platinum Punisher to the two Asgardians Laufey kills. First the freeze, then the smash, I mean that is basically a Mortal Kombat combo, so how can I not love that? The Broken Bone Claws for the worst kill is going to go to the 55 Frost Giants falling into the pit because of Thor. The special effect was fine, 
I'm mainly counting it because it was a test of sanity, but also because they simply disappear. Honestly, I wasn't sure about adding them. I mean, they could land on pillows at the bottom, but in the end, they went on, and I hate myself every moment since. And finally, the seal of worthiness for the most heroic moments is of course going to Thor standing up to the destroyer and taking a devastating backhand. A little predictable, yes, but it was worthy from this moment for a good reason. He sacrificed himself to save others, and if that's not what being a hero is, then I don't know what is. Next time we have Captain America, the first Avenger, which is ironic since it's the last movie until the Avengers and is the last of the Avengers that we get introduced to, but it's a good one, so subscribe so you don't miss it. That's all from me on today's Kill Counts. Thank you so very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one, and have a super rest of your day.